The band came into the studio to record their next masterpiece. At the top of the list were three songs. One was John's magnificent Strawberry Fields Forever, as well as two of Paul's songs, Penny Lane and When I'm 64. Of course, the very first song they would set to work on was John's magnificent Strawberry Fields Forever. So John Lennon even brings in a new toy, a brand new instrument and a marvel of technology at the time, the hallowed Mellotron. Later, when the Beatles actually added Moog synthesizer to Abbey Road, it was merely a flavor they would use for this recording. Other bands would take this instrument and identify themselves with it. But to the Beatles, their palette wide, it was something to be investigated. Now the Mellotron basically came with three banks of taped recorded music. And depending on what key you hit, it would play the note of that instrument a prelude to modern synthesizers, certainly. It also, like a lot of Casio keyboards from the late 60s through the early 80s, came with a collection of pre-played little samba pieces, a brass section with a Jimmy Durante, yeah, and even a rather serious recording of a flamenco guitar, the very recording he would use on the continuing story of Bungalow Bill on the White Album a short time later. But it was Paul who would look at the instrument and see it as a possible piece of orchestration for this completely new and wonderful song. You see, with the Mellotron, you had three choices. You could choose either strings, flute, or choir. Paul latched on the idea of flute, and this is where he developed the intro of Strawberry Fields Forever. For the distinctive drum sound for the song, Ringo dampened his drums with towels. Extra close miking on those drums provided this wonderful, powerful, muffled sound. Okay, but the work didn't stop there. As a matter of fact, it had barely begun. Now with the Beatles recording the basic tracks, Paul on the Mellotron, and everyone assigned to their post, you would have thought that would have been a complete song. And indeed, it had its charms. The lyrics carry the song. Now John's presence on Sgt. Pepper is a bit limited. You can give him credit for writing five songs, co-writing with a little help from my friends with Paul, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, For the Benefit of Mr. Kite, Good Morning, Good Morning, and of course the magnificent A Day in the Life. But I have to say that it's John's songs that flavor this album with just a little bit of acid. With lyrics that are seemingly designed to only make sense if you were high on LSD, it's in his songs where you really get the LSD flavor of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So where would they take this recording next? Now John had been listening to the mix of Strawberry Fields Forever for for a while now. And he came into the studio one day complaining that he wanted it to sound heavier. Now, with John Lennon, you usually got requests like, I want my voice to sound like the color yellow. And he was being almost as vague this time. It was George Martin, by the way, who suggested adding some orchestra to really give it a power. But John, quite uncharacteristically, I might add, right away even requested the specific instruments that he wanted in the orchestra on the song. So while there is a truth that John could be vague in his descriptions of what he wanted in his song, often leaving it up to Paul to translate Lenonese to Martinese. But this time he articulated himself well and George Martin got to work. Strawberry Fields Forever received more recording time, more energy put in, more changes into that song than any other John Lennon song ever recorded with the Beatles, including his magnificent A Day in a Life. After they recorded the orchestra that John wanted, he listened to it, he was happy with it, but then a few days passed. And that's when he came into the studio telling George Martin that, yeah, 
that's okay, but you know, I really like the beginning of the first one we did. And being non-technical John, he said, can't we just marry up the two pieces? The only problem was John evidently wasn't paying attention to the keys they were recorded in. You see, the two versions were a semitone apart. Not only that, they were also at different tempos. George Martin tried to explain this to John, with John just saying, you can fix it, and walking out of the studio, leaving the dirty job to George Martin and his team to figure out. Now this is where Jeff Emmerich and George Martin started talking. One of them brought up the fact that, you know, they were recorded at different tempos, but they're not that far off. And as for the semitone, if we adjusted the tempo, maybe that would make up for the semitone. So they would have to join these two tapes. The only problem with joining these two tapes with your average 45 degree cut that you would normally do in editing is that would present a far too jarring event in the recording. The listener would hear the change not only in tempo, but in tone as well. So Jeff Emmerich said he did one of the shallowest slicing jobs he ever did with tape. Instead of a 45 degree cut, we get this very long cut basically a crossfade artistically cut by the man then played for john john listened to it and asked jeff after the transition had occurred has it happened yet with jeff emmerich smiling at john saying yes it has john was elated now we had this very beautiful simple intro to the song as well as this most powerful magnificent ending of the song envisioned by john translated by George Martin, and done by Jeff Emmerich. This is what I call the Beatle machine. With all four Beatles even taking up the job of percussion to add minute to this wonderful song, the end result was something that pop music had never heard before. For the first time, we were hearing Lewis Carroll, so to speak. The images this song brings up are as good as any special effects I've ever seen in my life in any movie when I listen to this song. The relentless chase of sound, the pursuit of perfection, and just a touch of genius from the writer himself. Now the next song up for recording would be another one of Paul McCartney's, and that is the fabulous Penny Lane. Now it's interesting, with the start of Penny Lane, their entire approach on how to record music in the studio changed. During his break sessions, Paul McCartney had a portable phonograph that he would bring in to Abbey Road Studios. And often he was listening to the Beach Boys and specifically the Beach Boys album, Pet Sounds. Now, as we already discussed in the Revolver sessions, Paul had been very concerned about the bass sound of the Beatles. At this point, they had pretty much achieved a bigger bass sound and would continue to follow suit throughout the Sgt. Pepper sessions as well. But here we see McCartney had another pet peeve, and that was the very clean sound that Brian Wilson, as the producer and chief songwriter of the Beach Boys, was almost routinely achieving in the studios in America. So it was at this point that he brought in his song, Penny Lane. Just like John's song, Strawberry Fields Forever, this song was based on his childhood and some of his experiences on Penny Lane, the avenue itself. And just like John, his lyrics take on a poetry. As in Strawberry Fields Forever, you almost have to have an LSD-like experience to understand why people revere these two songs. And as I explained earlier, I have my own personal playlist of Sgt. Pepper, and I have always added these two songs to that playlist. And I think the saddest thing about not including these two songs is we don't get Paul's total psychedelic experience in a song that he has offered to us. Now back to the idea of achieving a more cleaner sound, Paul McCartney told Jeff Emmerich at this point that he wanted this clean sound. Of course, Jeff Emmerich 
immediately set into action. He suggested that they record each and every instrument on a separate track. Now, of course, with the limitations of four track, they had to be very careful how they approached this and still get the clean sound that Paul McCartney wanted. Now, this is the first time that Paul McCartney would be supplying the rhythm track. Now, by that, I mean often the rhythm track is the drums, maybe the bass mixed in as well, possibly a rhythm guitar. Ringo was known to be a human metronome, but it's interesting here. Paul did not employ him to tap out a beat for him in the studio, instead opting to keep the beat in his own head as he layered keyboard after keyboard after keyboard part, laboring on each overdub to achieve the sound he had in his head. With Jeff Emmerich in the studio keeping tape hiss at a minimum, bouncing carefully, and even admitting that there were so many piano overdubs for this song that some of the keyboard parts just got buried so far in the mix that they are virtually unhearable in any of the recordings of the song. But with each layering, the keyboard sound took on a totally different sound nature. When finally achieving the sound that Paul heard in his head and very careful overdubbing, they would then proceed further with the song. Now at this point, Paul wanted some orchestration. He came up with some specific ideas and even instruments. At this point, he wanted to add flutes, trumpets, piccolos, and flugelhorn. Now it's interesting, at this point, Jeff Emmerich brings up that later, more instruments were added. He doesn't give specific credit to George Martin once again, because with the addition of George Martin's additional instruments, we hear a wonderful song. And of course, George was the expert at the voicings of these particular instruments. Now you would think at this point, the song would be done, but no. In between recordings one night, Paul McCartney heard a concert on television. He had watched Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 2 the previous night, and he had heard an instrument that he had never quite picked up on before. So first thing in the studio, he asked, of course, George Martin, what was that high sound I heard? George Martin informed him it was the sound of a piccolo trumpet. Immediately, Paul knew what he needed to finish Penny Lane. Bringing in Dave Mason, one of the finest trumpet players in the world, with him sitting patiently as Paul tried to explain the notes he wanted to George Martin, and George Martin translating Paul's ideas onto paper, Dave Mason then proceeded to accomplish in one take that not even Paul McCartney could believe he could do. This is that high trumpet sound that pierces through the song, both in the middle of the song, as well as later editions of this song, providing an ending with the same piccolo trumpet. Paul, at this point, had the audacity to ask Dave to please re-record it again. This is when George Martin says, are you out of your mind, man? Nobody could possibly play that better. Dave Mason even saying, I'm sorry, I've played it the very best I can. Re-recording it won't change a thing. That's as good as I can do it. Now the book brings out that there was a flash of anger in Paul's eyes directed toward George Martin. But as usual, it didn't last long. And Paul replied, right, David, you're released on your own recognizance. And with that little bit of drama out of the way, another Beatle masterpiece was achieved. Now the next song up to be recorded was another John Lennon masterpiece. And this was A Day in the Life. 